Good evening. Welcome. My name is Lyndon K. Boozer, and on behalf of the LBJ Foundation, we're pleased to present a conversation with House Democratic Majority Whip James E. Clyburn, the third most powerful Democrat in the U.S. House of Representatives. Like former President Johnson, Congressman Clyburn understood very early the value of education. His very first job out of college was as a teacher in Charleston, South Carolina. He has devoted his entire life to equality, justice, civil rights, and opportunity. I urge you to read his memoirs, Blessed Experiences, Genuinely Southern, Proudly Black. At just 20 years old, he helped plan and participate in a march protesting the segregated lunch counters in Orangeburg, South Carolina. That led to other protests in the state capital of Columbia, South Carolina, for which he was thrown in jail. Of course, that's where he met his beloved Miss Emily. They were married almost six decades. Mr. Clyburn was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1992 and quickly rose up the leadership ladder, serving as vice chair and chair of the House Democratic Caucus. He was also chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus and assistant Democratic leader. For the second time, he now serves as a House Democratic whip or the chief vote counter in the House, another commonality he shares with the late, great LBJ. We are deeply grateful for his long commitment to public service and liberty and justice for all. This evening's conversation will be moderated by LBJ President and CEO Mark Updegrove. Thanks for joining us, and thanks to our programming sponsors, the Moody Foundation and San David's Healthcare. And now, without further ado, we present to you the House Democratic Majority Whip, James E. Clyburn and Mark Updegrove. Congressman James Clyburn, welcome. We are honored to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. Congressman, you came to Congress nearly three decades ago as Bill Clinton was taking office. What are the changes that you have seen in Congress since you took office in 1993? Well, the changes have been, let's just say, great. Um, when I came, it was the 103rd Congress. Uh, my class uh, in 1992, that election, uh, was the largest class since World War II. But uh, Congress uh, tended to uh, uh, work. Um, we uh, were of different parties, but we got along well. We um, uh, had uh, we socialized with each other across uh, party lines. Um, in fact, when I, I first came up here, I was the only member of the Congressional Black Caucus that was a golfer. Uh, and uh, most of the times I was on the golf course uh, with my Republican colleagues. Uh, but after 94, uh, Newt Gendritz uh, became the speaker. Uh, in the 94 election, you may recall, uh, was very, very uh, caustic. Uh, and um, things have not been the same since. Mm. Uh, and today, uh, members uh, be able to speak to each other. Uh, it's gotten uh, so now to uh, members have taken the calling each other names on the floor. Uh, the decorum is gone. Uh, the ability to uh, find common ground is very, very difficult uh, anymore. Uh, and I think a lot of that may, could be attributed to uh, uh, social media uh, and the extent to which uh, things have been weaponized via social media. Uh, the absence of the truth uh, is pretty pervasive. And these things have caused a tremendous deterioration uh, in the Congress. It seems, Congressman, that those divisions have become more pronounced since Newt Gingrich uh, ushered in this new era. Do you see it getting better or worse 
uh, over the next 10 years? I think it's going to get better. Uh, I, I do believe that um, uh, we are seeing some signs now uh, that people are rising up uh, to what's going on uh, via uh, the internet. Uh, people are beginning to um, look behind these um, sound bites and asking questions. And I noticed um, just in the last several days, uh, people's attitudes seem to be uh, getting a little, little better. Uh, even, uh, and, and that is on both sides of the aisle, I think. Hmm. There are many who maintain, Congressman, that your endorsement of Joe Biden last year not only led to him uh, getting the Democratic presidential nomination, but ultimately winning the presidency. And some go further and say that that endorsement saved the Democratic Party and perhaps even saved our republic. What led to your endorsement of, of Joe Biden? Well, several years ago, long before I came to Congress, I started having this fish fry. Now, a fish fry may sound uh, like just a thing that people do in campaigns, but I started having the fish fry simply because I noticed that on the night before our state democratic convention, uh, a lot of people came to Columbia for their state convention and didn't have anything to do on the night before, especially when there was a big fundraiser always taking place the night before. And a lot of the people that we depend upon to um, do grassroots work, uh, help turn out the vote, could not afford uh, to be going to that big fundraiser. So I started having a fish fry for them. Uh, and it grew and grew and grew. Well, in 2019, the fish fry was the biggest we had ever had. Had over 20 uh, candidates who were running for the presidency in attendance. And the fire department cut the attendees uh, off at 7,500. Biggest fish fry we'd ever had. So I got home that night and I said to my wife, who was uh, suffering with diabetes uh, and uh, did not feel up to coming to the fish fry, uh, I told her how successful it was. And then I said to her, I said, you know, we're going to have a tough time this year uh, trying to get a nominee because with 20 some odd people running, many of, uh, of them are close friends of ours, it's going to be tough. And she said to me, I don't know. I don't care how many people are running. I don't care how close we are uh, in friendship with uh, any of them. We've got to have Joe Biden as a nominee in order to be successful. Hmm. Uh, she felt that very strongly. And so just before the South Carolina uh, debate, I attended a funeral uh, of a long, my longtime accountant. And at that funeral, I encountered uh, a lady who I had never met before. Uh, and she asked me who I was going to vote for uh, in the primary, which would be coming up uh, about 10 days later. And I told her that I was going to vote for Joe Biden. And she said to me, she needed to hear that and the community needed to hear from me. And so that's what made me uh, do the endorsement the way I did, because as I left that church, several other people uh, expressed similar things to me that the community was waiting to hear from me. Uh, and so I, I made the endorsement. Uh, and it was as emotional as it was, because by this time, my wife had passed away. Uh, and um, uh, the endorsement itself uh, just took on a different meaning. And um, it was a bit emotional. Uh, and uh, South Carolinians and the country felt the emotions of the moment. And that's why I did it. And that's the way I, uh, and I guess it turned out okay. <laughs> well, I, I would say so, Congressman. But, I, I, you know, there, were, there are many of us who follow politics who knew that that would be a seminal moment, that, that it would be a game changer. Did you know the weight that your endorsement would have when you gave it to Joe Biden? No, I really didn't. Um, 
Uh, I thought that um, uh, I might have some influence. When I saw the uh, the um, exit polls, uh, and, and, and over 50% uh, of the people uh, said that um, my endorsement uh, carried um, uh, a whole lot of weight with them. And, and a lot of people were just saying they were they were really waiting to hear from me. So what was said to me in that churchyard uh, seemed to have been um, uh, pretty pervasive throughout the state, uh, and the way people responded to it. No, I didn't expect that. Uh, I was hoping uh, to have some influence, but um, uh, I had no idea uh, of the weight. What were you feeling, Congressman, when? Joe Biden was announced as the winner of the 2020 election on November 7th of last year. Well, uh, when he was finally uh, determined, uh, when they finally made it official, um, I, I was uh, I was out on the golf course, uh, and uh, I got this phone call. Well, you know, being majority whip. Um, we, um, we have a security detail. And um, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, security people came out to the golf, out to the green. I was, uh, I was playing pretty good and uh, was approaching the 15th hole. And, uh, and I saw this look on his face. He says, uh, they just declared Joe Biden the winner. Uh, I says, great. He says, but um, they need you <laughs> back at your house. And um, I said, okay, uh, I'll be there as soon as I finish this round, man. I'm, I'm winning <laughs> the money. He says, no, I'm, I'm told to bring you now. So I had to leave the golf course while I was ahead. And um, uh, on the way home, uh, I... Um, I started having feelings that um, uh, Emily had, had set me on the right course again. Hmm. Uh, Congressman, when you make an endorsement like that, that carries that kind of weight and changes things the way it, it did, um, how did Joe Biden respond? Did you get a did you get a coffee mug or a T-shirt or something? <laughs> how, did, how, did, how did he express his gratitude to you for for making that uh, that, that that endorsement? Well, we talked uh, the night of the election. Now, uh, on November third, um, I was waiting on the returns, and as you recall, uh, the returns were slow coming in. And of course, I'm looking at the totals, and I was sweating it. Uh, and the phone rang that night, I guess around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and it was Joe, and he thanked me, and he was pretty positive. Well, I wasn't positive, and I, you know, I, I accepted his thanks, and I started expressing some reticence about uh, what, uh, what might happen. But he was pretty certain that, um, that he was where he needed to be. Uh, and so I gather from that that they were looking behind the numbers. I was only seeing what the TV people were reporting. They were getting numbers from the folks they had out there. So uh, we had a pretty upbeat conversation. Uh, but when I hung up, I was still not convinced. Now, this is Tuesday night. Uh, it was, I think it was a Saturday uh, when they declared him. When I, and so I was on eggshells. Uh, up until that point. The, the, I want to go from, from what must have been a great moment of elation to um, a moment of tragedy, which is the Capitol siege that happened two months after Joe Biden was declared the winner in the presidential election. Um, what were you feeling when the Capitol was under siege on January 6th, Congressman? Well, as you know, we were meeting to make official the electoral college and that's always you know a joint session and i had an assigned seat uh, on the main floor there were only 11 uh, people on our side of the aisle 
11 members uh, seated on the floor uh, because we were social distancing and we were doing everything that the uh, attending the physicians told us to do. But I noticed on the other side of the aisle, the Republicans were not uh, adhering to that. Uh, and I said to someone, I said, you know, uh, these guys are not um, really cooperating with the attending physician. Nancy's going to have a tough time here today. Nancy Pelosi was presiding. And, um, uh, but I settled down and, and the vote started. And a lot of us were talking to Nancy about whether or not she should preside. Uh, because people just had a feeling of, of just unease. Uh, and, but she insisted that she was going to. But then, not long after the voting uh, the, the started, I looked up and Nancy was being escorted off of the podium. Hmm. Now, that was a bit unusual. Uh, but as I looked at her, just beyond her, uh, was a head of my security detail uh, beckoning the meeting uh, to come over. And I went over to her and she said, we got to get out of here. The building has been breached. Hmm. Um, and they took me down a security route to get out of the building. In fact, there were staircases I didn't know who were really there. Uh, and we went to this undisclosed location. Now, all of this time, uh, I never felt uh, any real fear. Um, I don't know why, hmm. uh, but I didn't. I just dismissed it as being a fire drill. Uh, it was not until I got to this undisclosed location and uh, saw the television accounts that I realized how serious it was. Hmm. I didn't feel that in the building. So I never got a chance to feel the way so many people who were trapped up in the balcony because some members uh, were up in the balcony because as I said, we were social distancing, so they were all over the place. And when I saw that, and I saw uh, the TV accounts of what was going on, is when I really realized what real danger we were in. What, what were members of your staff experiencing at that time? Well, I finally got a call uh, from a staff member who told, me, uh, who told me at the time that they were all huddled in my office uh, with the furniture at the door uh, and that people were on this floor. Uh, I thought that kind of strange because in Statuary Hall, I have an office that opens on the Statuary Hall. In fact, that's the only office where you see my name and title above the door. Uh, and inside that office, while all this was going on, uh, was Cedric Richmond. Uh, and um, nobody ever disturbed that door. Nobody knocked on the door. Nobody attempted to come in there. But they're all in what some people refer to as my hideaway office, a part of the building that people don't frequent unless they've got business. Uh, but that's where they were. Hmm. Uh, and that's when I began to feel something untoward was taking place. Why would they not uh, disturb the office on Statuary Hall where so many of them were? They were taking pictures of each other next to the statues, and I got statues on either side of that door. And Cedric Richmond told me later, nobody ever even knocked on the door. Uh, so I felt then that something really untoward was taking place. And so uh, I began to get a different feel about what was going on. You were sequestered in a secret location with congressional leaders, including Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. Right. Nancy, the, the, uh, the, the, the House Speaker and Mitch McConnell, the, the Majority Leader of the Senate. And you said of that experience, 
there were interactions between both leaders. And I got to say this, some of my friends will be upset with me, but Mitch McConnell was great. And we worked together, not just to make that visit good, but to put in place getting back to the Capitol to ensure a peaceful transfer of power. Do you think that experience in any way, Congressman, led to healing the divisions that had become so pronounced during the Trump war? Well, I don't know if it will. Uh, I was sharing what I saw, what I felt, and we were huddled together, uh, getting each other's opinions about what we should do. And it was very cooperative. Uh, and it's a sign of what can happen. Now, whether or not uh, it will happen, I guess we'll see uh, in the next few days because we're going to be tested on these voting rights and civil rights stuff that we've got to deal with here in this Congress going uh, in the very near future. And whether or not uh, we are going to see uh, this ancient relic called the filibuster uh, allow that to stop us from uh, doing what's needed to protect the voting rights of citizens. Mr. McConnell holds a secret to that. Mm. Uh, and so we'll see. Uh, but there's certain was cooperation uh, between the two parties and the leadership on that day. And we came back to the floor. Right. The Senate got back around eight the house around nine and um by early morning the next morning we had completed our work uh, and the uh effective though maybe not too efficient uh transfer of power had taken place i, I want to get i want to get back to that in a moment the the notion of the the filibuster as a, an obstacle to to voting rights but but since that said you you've been on capitol hill for as i mentioned nearly three decades now since the siege does it feel the same congressman or is there a different feeling that you have given the fact that 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 citadel of democracy the capital of the united states was was violated on on january 6th this seemingly impregnable place uh was broken into by these marauders so, so does it feel different does it feel, you feel more vulnerable than you once did oh yes um I'm not fearful or anything, uh, but I do feel that um, uh, there are some things, uh, some cleansing that need to take place. Uh, there are people getting elected to this body now. Now that they have very uh, low regards for the institution. Uh, there are people who are getting elected who think their job is to tear down the institution. Uh, and I just think that uh, uh, that puts us all at great risk. I see behind you, Congressman, a uh, bust of Lyndon Johnson. That is the award that we gave you several years ago, the highest award from the LBJ Foundation, our Liberty and Justice for All Award, which was rightfully given to you. Uh, but Joe Biden invoked Lyndon Johnson last week when he said, for too long, it's been the folks at the top. Well, you know what trickle down does. We've known it for a long time. But this is the first time we've been able to, since the Johnson administration, to begin to change the paradigm. And so he has very lofty ambitions to change uh, our uh, American society in the same manner that Lyndon Johnson did with the Great Society. But Lyndon Johnson had Republicans rallying around to the cause. We wouldn't have civil rights, as you know, Congressman without Northern Republicans rallying around the laws that Lyndon Johnson had proposed around civil rights, including voting rights. Is the Congress too divided um, for there to be a paradigm change during the Biden administration? Well, there's no question about the Congress being divided. Uh, you know that bus of Lyndon Johnson, that next to it is the bus of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, and uh, uh, that might uh, also foretell something for uh, uh, for Biden. Uh, we expect for uh, uh, Joe Biden when he gets the opportunity to put uh, the first African American woman 
uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, so that would be uh, be a good thing, I think. Um, I don't think it's too divided. It is divided, no question about that. But there has to be a seminal moment. It usually is. Uh, and it could very well be a, a similar moment taking place very soon uh, that will uh, tell the world, uh, much as the speech that uh, Mitch McConnell gave after the 6th of January. That was an incredible speech, uh, talking about uh, how the antics of the uh, outgoing president um violated everything that this country stands for uh, that to me uh, was a seminal moment it didn't last very long uh but we'll i think we can have a seminal moment as it relates to uh, uh legislation going forward we lost your dear friend john lewis last year john lewis a great proponent of voting rights in the country congressman uh, and there is a bill in his name to ensure that voting, we have voting rights in this country going forward. But you have said of the filibuster and in its way, there's no way under the sun that in 2021 that we are going to allow the filibuster to be used to deny voting rights. That just ain't going to happen. That would be catastrophic. So how do you defeat the filibuster? I don't know if you have to defeat it. Uh, I think that what you have to do is a combination uh, of what um, President Biden is talking about and what uh, I, along with some of uh, uh, our progressive uh, members of the caucus, are talking about. Number one, uh, what has made the filibuster so lethal in recent days is you don't have to stand on the floor anymore. Uh, the filibuster was something you had to go to the floor and you had to uh, give up a certain uh, amount of your own uh, conveniences to uh, uh, to carry out. But what they've done of late is you don't have to ever be on the floor. Uh, you can effectively uh, filibuster virtually, though we don't call it that. So President Biden is saying he's going to, uh, he wants to go back to the, I think he called it the standing mm -hmm. filibuster. Now, that may be fine when it comes to legislation. But I believe that just as we've done a carve out of the filibuster rules as it relates to the budget that we call reconciliation, uh, which we just used uh, to pass this budget, which we're getting ready uh, to use again uh, to pass uh, the budget related infrastructure bill. Uh, there ought to be a carve out for civil and voting rights. These are basically constitutional issues. Legislation uh, has to do uh, with maybe someone's favorite program or, uh, or proposal, uh, but it's not rooted in the constitution. Voting rights, civil rights, rooted in the constitution. So what I have been proposing is that they ought to be an exemption from filibusters for these constitutional issues, just as we've done for the budget. One of the reasons that Donald Trump won the election in 2016 is because rural voters who had voted for Barack Obama eight years before had drifted to the Republican Party and, and were taken by the candidacy of Donald Trump. How does the Democratic Party win back rural voters? Just as the way we're doing it, but we got to do it in such a way uh, that the age old um, adage that I, uh, I live by, and that is, you got to go out and tell the people in rural America what you're going to do for them. And we did that in this past election. And we have done a whole lot of what we said we were going to do. Uh, with the American Rescue Plan. Now we got to do a big, broad infrastructure program. Broadband has got to be a part of it. Uh, rural uh, hospitals 
got to be a part of it. All that's in the community health care centers. These are rural programs. So if we do a real broad-based infrastructure program the way we've done the, the so-called rescue plan, we will have demonstrated to the rural Americans uh, not just by words, but by our deeds. Uh, because I think it's very clear now. I just saw a poll this morning saying 72% of the American people support the American Rescue Plan. I've also seen some headlines that says our Republican friends are having some trepidations about how they're going to rescue themselves uh, from having not supported this plan and so many of their constituents are feeling good about it. I saw headlines a couple of days ago saying that um, rural voters uh, or have warmed up uh, to Democrats and to uh, to Biden. So we keep doing this, we get them back. And we'll have them for 2022. We have seen a staggering increase in our deficit in the community. $20 trillion when Barack Obama left office, it's $27 trillion today. It escalated dramatically in the Trump administration uh, in January of 2020, well before the pandemic relief package had gone through Congress, Philip Swagnell, the director of the Congressional Budget Office, said, not since World War II has the country seen deficits during times of low unemployment that are so large as those that we project, nor in the latter part of the century has it experienced large deficits for as long as we project. So how do we reintroduce the notion of fiscal responsibility in federal spending? Well, I think that what we got to do is make sure that these investments we are making that are uh, really deficit spending, uh, and uh, we've got to begin uh, to, when the economy uh, begins to grow, we got to use uh, that growth to pay down debt and to reduce uh, deficit spending. Um, right now, uh, we cannot be concerned uh, about the deficit or the debt when you're trying to keep people, uh, livelihoods and lives uh, afloat. Uh, when things are stabilized, uh, then I think you begin to go back uh, to um, uh, watching the deficit and paying down the debt. Remember, Barack Obama uh, came in the office at the beginning of the so-called Great Recession that hit us in September uh, 2008. Uh, so he had to spend time. Uh, we were losing about 700,000 jobs a month. Uh, and so uh, it stands uh, traditionally uh, Republicans have driven us uh, into these kinds of situations, and the Democrats have been there to clean up the mess. Uh, Lyndon Johnson had to do it. Barack Obama had to do it. Bill Clinton before had to do it. Now it falls Joe Biden's uh, plight to have to do it. Did you see uh, in, during the Biden administration a trend perhaps toward lower deficit spending? I think so. If the economy starts to grow, uh, as it looks like it will, uh, yes, absolutely, I see that. In fact, I'm a big advocate uh, for doing a big infrastructure program, pay it for. <laughs> I don't want to see uh, us paying for this infrastructure program uh, by going by borrowing money. And we can pay for it. So what we've got to do is make sure that everybody that's going to benefit from it uh, pay into it properly. That's why I've been advocating things like a transaction tax. Mm -hmm. Look, what we did back in 2009, uh, even in 2008, before 2009, uh, Barack Obama saved the automobile industry. Uh, 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 we saved Wall Street. Uh, and my whole thing is, what did, did they contribute to that? Right. And so here we are now with a flourishing economy. It's time, and that's why I want to see this transaction tax. One tenth of one percent of the transaction tax will yield around seven hundred and fifty billion dollars. That'll pay a, that's a big hunk of change for 
an infrastructure program. And there's some other things that we can do. Uh, for instance, we dropped the corporate tax rate to 21. Nobody ever wanted it at 21. Uh, we wanted to see the corporate uh, rate uh, drop, but nobody ever talked about it being below 25. We woke up when the bill came here, uh, 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 the Trump administration dropped it all the way to 21. And that was at a point of diminishing returns. Hmm. It put an end to the building of affordable housing because he took the corporate rate to a point of diminishing returns. That shouldn't be. And so Biden said he's going to increase the corporate rate. So let's do it. Let's find the street spot. I think it's somewhere between 25 and 28 uh, you find the street spot for a corporate rate. And that income coming in, stop paying down uh, the debt. Stop uh, using uh, it to um, uh, do uh, the pay for infrastructure. And who knows, uh, it may be time for us to look at a VAT, a value added tax. Uh, it's time for us, I think, to do an infrastructure bank, amortize some of the big spending we do on uh, bridges and, uh, and roads uh, out of an infrastructure bank. That's the way we pay for homes. We pay the mortgages out 15, 20, 25 year mortgages. You can do that with an infrastructure bank. So I think we can do this. We just got to uh, get outside of our comfort zones to do it. You described the events that we saw last summer, the racial injustice that we saw last summer as an inflection point. And as you put it, for those of us who were activists in the 1960s, we today are living with much of what we thought was behind us. So how do we once and for all put racial equity on our agenda and ensure that there is equality for all Americans? Well, I don't know that you do it once and for all. Um, uh, I'm a great proponent of the, uh, the pendulum uh, on the clock notion of how our society works. I, I often say that um, things in our society move like a pendulum on the clock. It goes right for a while, then it goes back left for a while, and then it goes back to the right again. That's the way it's always been. So I don't know uh, that you will solve these problems once and for all. I think that what you have to do is recognize that certain fundamental rights or not ever be violated. And you have uh, various notions dealt with from left to right, but not constitutional principles. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't uh, ever ought to be bargaining in a way or filibustering people's constitutional rights and their basic civil rights as citizens. These things ought to be off the table. And then uh, we'll deal with all these other notions uh, that may be a favorite project here or something on the other side. But uh, the only way for us to really uh, have some modicum of success uh, with racial issues uh, is to uh, take them out uh, of the legislative um, uh, back and forth. Uh, you ought not be legislating uh, people's fundamental rights. Whoever may be the president, uh, it ought to be beyond uh, the president's notion to determine whether or not I've got the right to vote. vote. Congressman, going back to those days when you were an activist in the 1960s fighting for civil rights, if you had had a crystal ball then and you could look forward to 2021 and see where we are as a society, would you have achieved as much in the way of civil rights or would you be disappointed that we haven't achieved enough? Well, I, um, I thought with the election of uh, uh, Barack Obama, that we had um, uh, really uh, taken uh, the road less traveled, I guess. Um, but I knew almost immediately, I felt immediately. I didn't know about the meeting that um, Mitch McConnell and others were having on the night of the inauguration, just six blocks from the Capitol, uh, plotting. Uh, 
to make his life miserable as president. Um, but I felt uh, within uh, days uh, when Mr. McConnell said that his his number one goal was to make Barack Obama a one-term president. Mm. And I knew what would go into trying to make sure that happened. Of course, he, he failed in the effort, but the fact that he went through the process, uh, it started to tear away at the foundations uh, that held this country together for such a long time. Um, and so uh, I, I began to feel almost immediately uh, that um, uh, the progress I thought uh, we had made was just a fleeting moment. I had no idea it would continue to go to where we are now uh, to result in a four year presidency of what we just, uh, just had. Mm. I don't know if I thought uh, it would get that bad, uh, but I always thought that the pendulum would go back another direction. Uh, it went left with Barack Obama's uh, election. I had no idea where to go as far right as it did uh, under Donald Trump. As you look forward to the challenges that we face uh, during the course of the next four years as, as with Joe Biden in the White House, what is your greatest concern, Congressman? My greatest concern right now is whether or not uh, we all uh, do what is necessary to make this country's greatness accessible and affordable for everybody. You know, it's one thing to have access to health care. It's something else to be able to afford health care. Uh, and that's just uh, an example of what I'm talking about. I, you know, the, there's so much money uh, in our health care system. Uh, and we've got a great health care system. Um, but everybody can't afford it the healthcare system that we have. Uh, so the question then becomes, um, uh, how do you make it affordable for everybody? Mm -hmm. uh, that to me is what uh, keeps me awake at night, making sure that the greatness of our uh, country uh, is made accessible and affordable to all of its citizens. What do you most hope to achieve before the midterms of next year? Oh, I want to see a massive infrastructure program. Mm -hmm. And I want to see 100% uh, build out of accessible and affordable broadband for everybody. You know, I'm one of those people who believe that broadband uh, can be to the 21st century, whether electricity was uh, in the 20th century. And so, you know, it's one thing. Electricity has been around for a long time. And I, I, I've been telling people, especially in Black History Month, uh, if we just look, if we said electricity was was just great, and we look back at how we got there, it wasn't just Thomas Edison that we talked about. It was Louis Latimer uh, as well. Thomas Edison was a white guy with the light bulb, but it was Louis Latimer, the black guy, that had the filament. And it was not until that filament and light bulb came together uh, that we were able to illuminate the world. Uh, a black guy and a white guy uh, work together to illuminate the world. And I think uh, that's the, the notion uh, that I'm traveling with today, uh, that we got to get outside of our comfort zones in so many areas uh, that we recognize uh, the individual work that exists in each and every one of us uh, and take advantage of that. Uh, that is the only thing that's going to move this agenda forward. Uh, and I think uh, that is what's going to be required for us to continue this trek uh, towards a more perfect union. Well, Congressman James Clyburn, I thank you not only for your time today, but for all the light that you have brought to our world uh, in, uh, in, in as, as a civil rights leader and as a, a leader in Congress. Thank you so much, Congressman. Well, thank you very much for having me.